All right, and we're back. We took a little detour, checked out a uh, 350R over in the photo studio. I thought my, my, Matt might like that. But uh, now we're back. You'll see yeah, that we later. Yeah, we hooked up uh, Tyler Senarusa was here doing a, a little photo shoot in the studio. Yeah. So that was cool. So we got to take a little detour. Next thing uh, you know, I'm buying a helmet yeah. for all yeah. the racing that I'm not doing. <laughs> we just talked about Track it. Tyler day, didn't know he'd be selling a helmet today. <laughs> oh, but... we just got rid of this, too. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so you heard our story. We kind of got into yeah. a little of the rag company's history. Yeah. But, of course... For those who don't know, I imagine many do, but for those who don't know, let's hear your story. Yeah, man. Tell us. Which which version do you want? Do you want the uh, Obsessed Garage story or want the whole Maddie story? You, which would, you let's can get the tell whole Maddie the whole story. Maddie story. Yeah. We're going right. long form. Let's do it. We're, we're well, going to be doing lunch endearing. at 2 p.m. Yeah. now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we got time. It's all right. Pizza will stay warm. <laughs> we're going to be in here for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so I was born in 19... 19- yeah. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Fast right. forward. No, I I, uh, I grew up in uh, in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. We, we you know originally from Pittsburgh, and then uh, we moved uh, when I was thirteen to to northeastern PA. And um, I was uh, an obsessed kid. Like uh, I was the kid who you know remember Matchbox cars. Yep. You know, back in the day, mm-hmm. you guys probably don't, but Levi and I do. I know Matchbox oh yeah, we cars. do. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I as a five year old. I appreciated Matchbox over Hot Wheels because they were superior designed and more accurate. Oh, right? uh, yeah. And See, and I like the Hot Wheels because they were just more wild. They were cooler, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, look, look at yeah. you. Well, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Right. <laughs> so I, you know, I was a Matchbox kid, and so imagine, you know, yourself as a kid. I mean, most kids would go out and drive them in the dirt and – you know, smash them together, mm-hmm. and you know, inevitably, you know, my friends. Me. Remember, the wheels would always kind of bend yeah. out because oh, kids would yeah. lean into Little them. Stance. I would drive yeah, me crazy as a four, five, six-year-old, right? Yep. Yeah. And so, me as a kid, I I would get all my cars out. I you know, I had you know, had I wanted a complete set of every you know series. So that was that was the start of me wanting complete sets of things, and I would line them up. Like and then I'd line up like say a hundred of them, then I'd distill it down to fifteen of them, and I'd distill it down to okay, so these are the six of them that are going to be parked. I had one one of these floor mats that was like a a plastic mat where you had like this was my house, so one of the houses was mine, and so then these were the four that were going to be parked in the yard, and then I would distill it down to which is the one that goes in the garage, right? And I'm not joking. Like this is what I did. No, I did the same thing. (laughs) Yeah, no, my dad would sit and do that with me. And so I would spend hours getting it all set up, and then I would put them back away, and then I would do the same thing the next day, and I would, you know, I would I would sort of sort through these yeah. Matchbox cars to figure out which was the one I liked that day, and it usually ended up being similar ones, mm-hmm. um, but some days I would change my mind a little bit, and that's a lot very similar to what I do today yeah. with, you know, microfiber towels, uh, and so I was that type of kid, you know, so I... You know, in in high school, I I didn't grow till I was about seventeen, and so I, um, I wanted to I I, I, I played every sport: football, baseball, basketball, soccer, uh, until I was thirteen. So when we moved from Pittsburgh to Hazleton, Pennsylvania, I stopped playing sports because I was tiny. Yeah, and you know, Hazleton is like a, a, no offense to Italians, but they grow a lot earlier than little <laughs> little you know English boys do. And so I'm in Hazleton, which is a primarily Italian town, and all the kids are fully grown at you know at, at 12 years old, yeah. and I'm this tiny, tiny little guy, and uh, and so I didn't play any sports, and so I started skateboarding. You know, so I wasted my you know my my you know, 13 to 17 skateboarding. And uh, and so I eventually went out and um, this is why I obsessed over skateboarding, which is a terrible sport because I'm a, I mentioned I'm a pansy, so I was <laughs> I could 360 flip great, but I couldn't 360 flip off of anything because I'd yeah. be afraid of hurting myself. I could do four stairs perfectly well because I, I was obsessed with the style and how I landed. But if you had six steps, I'd be too afraid to yeah. go do it. Um, and so that was a terrible choice of sports, but snowboarding and skateboarding were the thing I obsessed over for a while. And then I went and I wanted to play a sport when I started to grow. I'm like, shoot, I could probably, I'm be a legit athlete. And so I, I went and tried it for the volleyball team because girls play volleyball and anybody could make the volleyball team because nobody gave a crap. And so I showed up and I ended up being all state and, uh, and I started junior and senior year and then I went to Villanova and Philadelphia and, and, and started playing volleyball and, 
um, as you might imagine, this you know matchbox kid. I was I became an engineering student. You know, engineering just yeah. suited me. Like I couldn't be a doctor because I'm afraid of going to the doctor. I couldn't be a lawyer because I read too slowly. And so the hardest thing that I could do was be an engineer. And so I, I even at a really young age, I kind of knew I'd be an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I went to Villanova in Philly and got um, and eventually got an, a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, but when I was at college, um, you know, my when I grew up in a single wide trailer you know, yeah. in, in, in Pennsylvania, I grew up, you know, I, I changed my story a little bit and how I've how I remembered it. I like to think I grew up like this poor, you know, single wide trailer kid. Yeah. Right. That's how I grew up. But I really didn't. Although I had to work for things and I yeah. couldn't get everything I wanted. I mean, I had Air Jordans. I had LA gear, remember? Yeah, yep. you know? I remember LA gear. <laughs> I had Matchbox cars. I had He Man. Yep. I had, I had. So you had, we're, we're, you had stuff, right? We're, we weren't like living on the street, you know. Yeah. So I, I love to pretend like I had this rags to riches story, but you know, humble, humble. It was a humble, me, yeah, yeah, humble growing up or upbringing. But my parents were like super, super hard workers. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. they were machines. They just never reached like I've been yeah. fortunate. They've given me the ability to reach for things, right? And so, um, when I was in high school, and I worked, mm -hmm. I mean, I worked like a machine. You know, I just emulated what I learned from my yeah. parents. So I, you know, I, I pushed carts at Walmart, and I worked. I, I was a janitor for my community, so I cleaned toilets and things like that. Uh, and and so I knew what it was like to work for real. And then I somehow got to go to Villanova, which was almost forty thousand dollars a year. And and I wasn't I wasn't a particularly good student. One thing I've never been obsessed with was studying. Yeah. Like I, I didn't even yeah. know what that meant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I showed up at Villanova and everybody's studying for the first exam, I'm like what are you guys freaking Just doing? Just rereading stuff? I don't get that. <laughs> That's like, how I was. I went to class most yeah. of the time. I mean, I just show up and I think I got a 52 on the first test. <laughs> Luckily, yeah. everything was great on the curve in engineering school, so I ended up with a C. But I'd never got a C <laughs> before. You know, it's just A's, always A's, maybe a B, and I'm gonna just show up and take it. So, anyway, I grew up having you know a hundred bucks here or there from working you know minimum wage jobs, you know real blue collar right. stuff. And so when I went to college, it was the first time in my life I didn't have a job. Um, and but but my between my sophomore and junior year, I flunked. Uh, so and going with the not studying thing, I flunked fundamentals of electrical engineering. And because it's 40K a year, a fifth year wasn't an option. Yeah. yeah. Four years yeah. really wasn't an option. I was borrowing money to be there. Yeah. And and so I had to take a summer class. And I was a typical engineer. I wouldn't look in the eye. I, you know, I, I didn't, didn't, I wasn't like a public speaker. I was a typical introvert type. And, uh, uh, but I had passion for stuff, cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. And at that time, it was all pursuit. I had a five year plan. I'm going to get jacked. I'm going to get a girl. <laughs> I'm going to make $100,000. Those were the, th that was part of the five year plan. And I wore that on my sleeve. Everybody knew yeah. what my five year plan was. Uh, and, and when I flunked the course, my five year plan went to crap. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to flunk out of school. I only flunked one class. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, you have to in engineering school. There's no like electives. You just right. have to you take 20 credit hours every semester the whole way through, uh, and so there was no room. So I had to stay on track, and so I went to Bally Total Fitness and applied for a minimum wage job. And I went to Tower Records back when we had record yep. stores, and I thought that would be cool because I could buy DVDs, yep. you know, cheap. Yep. And uh, and so I, but I was obsessed with electronics. So remember Sony ES. Yep. You know, I wanted a Sony ES receiver for my home theater. I had a five disc DVD player. This was 1999, right? So that was yeah. a big deal. I'd saved up and got a $500 five disc Sony CD player, and and then I had was into car audio, and so I I went and I dropped my resume. I typed up a resume. I made myself look really smart. Dropped it off at at Bryn Mawr Stereo while I was applying for these crappy jobs. And so I got a job as the as the the gym train. They call it floor trainer, but it was the dude who cleaned the you know the bench after yeah. somebody sweat all over it. Yeah. Right? It was going to be six six fifteen an hour. That nice. was my that was my yeah, that's good was money paid. back then. That was a buck more than minimum wage. Yep. So live in large. Right. 
And uh, and while I was doing all the preliminary hiring, I was supposed to start like that Monday or something. Uh, and I got a call from the stereo store from the manager, and he said, "Don't don't take that job. Come hear us out." I'm like, "That's sorry, it's too late. I already, already took it." So again, this is summer between sophomore and junior year because I had to stay on tracks. So I had to take a summer course. So I had to stay in Philly, which is two hours away from my parents lived. And so I went in there, and they sat me down and said, um, "What you know? What do you know about uh, car stereo?" I freaking know everything about car stereo. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just went off. I'm like, well, "What would you like to know? Do you want to know about Eclipse head units? I knew all the model numbers. I knew the you know, the specs of how much amplification, which ones were dedicated right. preamps, yeah. what was the voltage pre out, um, how many pre outs did they have, um, I, I, how much did they cost yeah. off the top of my head because I wanted to buy it all. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't want to sell it to anybody. I just wanted to own it. I wanted it, but yep. I couldn't get it because I didn't have any money. Yeah, and I would have like a hundred bucks a semester." Um, cause I'd go home and I'd work for a subcontractor cleaning. One of my jobs was to organize his dumpster so he could fit more crap in it. Yeah. <laughs> so I was the best gosh darn dumpster organizer <laughs> yeah. on the planet. Didn't know that was a job. Yeah, I didn't either. But you know, <laughs> he would, the people would throw it in a dumpster. I'd climb in the dumpster and move the drywall around and the junk Tetris. and the old toilet. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So that we could fit more crap. And I'm not, I'm not making this up. I wish I did. I wish I was, but I was really good at that. And so I walked into this place and I told him all that I knew and he said okay well we're looking for a part-time stock guy a guy to do the stock room and and then you'll uh, when you're not doing that we'll have you fill in the gaps in the car stereo sales floor and so I come in and I and my very first day is like oh look there's nothing to do in the stock room uh, so just go learn something and so I'm in the high end room there were some things I didn't know I didn't know Alpine very well yeah uh, and so there were some products I've just got the catalog i'm standing in the catalog i'm in the room i'm gonna i'm gonna know everything there is to know about every, every right every yeah part and piece in here i'm gonna know about every car i'm gonna know about every situation and so i'm standing in the room and within the first hour or so and some guy walks in and uh he had just bought a jeep grand cherokee you know which was you know this was outside philadelphia a wealthy area and um, I'm thinking nothing of it i don't have any agenda i'm not trying to sell him anything and i just started talking about what i would buy you know, mm -hmm. I do these Boston Acoustics Pro 6.5 Pro. We'd put your crossovers, you know, and we'd build an amp play up, you know, build a, an amp rack. And I think you should do this X stand amplifier, and then we should do an Eclipse head unit and all the stuff. And I'm like, but you need this Metro harness in order to get it all set up. And he said, okay, I'll, ta I'll take it. I was like, okay, cool. And, you know, I probably didn't look him in the eye the whole entire time. Yeah. And, uh, and I walked out and I go to the um, to the to the manager to, to, and we were commissioned, right? I didn't know what commission was. I didn't know I was commissioned. Yeah. I didn't even know what I was making. I yeah. was just happy to be there. And so I I you know the guy um, I, I go to the, to the manager said, okay, here's what he wants, and I list it all off, and he just looks at me, and he's just always ticked, like because this is it was ended up being a, almost a five thousand like forty six or seven hundred dollar oh. car stereo system. And we got paid 16% of the profit. Car yeah. stereos had 40 to 45% margins on things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about, you know, you know, you're talking, you know, in profit, you're what, two grand in profit, and we made 16% of that. Yeah. So, you know, there's, you know, there's a, you know, a good a chunk $300, for a yeah. yeah, $300 commission this dude just missed out on. I'm sure there were some spiffs on, on some of the other products. And so, you know, three, 400 bucks. I didn't know that, but I could just see in his eye. And so I'm standing there just kind of chatting it and just chatting with the customer uh, while this other guy's punching it in. And the manager comes up afterwards. He pulls me aside. He says, what's going on here? I said, I don't know. This guy, you know, he came in and he, he wanted a stereo. So I told him what I'd buy and he bought it. And then the manager looks at me and says, bro, you're not. We'll get someone else to do the stock room. You're going to sell, mm -hmm. and so they sent me to the. the, the they had um, a sales training. It was top down selling. So you would start at the top product and kind of work your way down, and you would you would teach people the features, the advantage, and the benefits. They called it fab selling, feature advantage, yeah. benefit. Yeah. It was the old Xerox style sales training. So they sent me to sales training, and I was like, once I figured out what commission was. I was like a gosh darn, f I mean, it was like an awakening. Yeah, yeah, like, you're like, oh. You just awoken the beast of this <laughs> money-motivated monster. Yeah. And I became the number, uh, you know, eventually became the number one, you know, home theater salesman in, you know, in the area. And so I went from making a hundred bucks organizing dumpsters 
to I was making fifty thousand. The first year I made, oh, I think it was forty seven thousand dollars. Insane. <laughs> I'm tw- I'm twenty years old, nineteen yeah. years old, and uh, I'm, you know I'm at Villanova, and I'm like, well, shoot, I'm not doing this for the summer. I'm going to keep doing this. So I did it my junior year, my senior year. When I graduated, I was making about a hundred grand, you know, ninety thousand bucks or so. And I was growing crazy because yeah, yeah. I'd started to develop a following. Yeah. People that listened and wanted to come see me because yeah, I didn't come BS them. Yep. I wasn't selling anything. Well, you get that. It's, it goes right back to those customers that you're providing that customer service. So they yeah. refer you. They're like, yeah. oh, hey, you know, I just got my stereo in. Here's right. I education. didn't know what any of that meant. Yeah. I was just, I love Mitsubishi and, Diamond 65 inch TVs. It was six grand. That was the most expensive thing in the store. I wanted it and I wanted everybody else to have it. Yeah. And yeah. I knew everything there was to know about it. I would go to the different trainings and I would be teaching the reps about the stuff because I knew everything there was no. And I, we didn't sell Hitachi, but I knew all about Hitachi because, you know, I wanted to know what what other things were. Well, while the other dudes were sitting there waiting for the next up, I was studying. Yeah. But the weird thing is, I didn't study in school. Yeah. Yeah. Because it wasn't interesting to me. I didn't give. Well, a crap it wasn't about motivating that. then. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't your. It wasn't my passion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so when I graduated, all my buddies were going to work for Lockheed and Unisys, and they're going to make, you know, 50 grand, 40 grand, 35 grand doing AutoCAD or doing some yeah. menial engineering tasks in order to Starting build their career. Starting out as an engineer. Yeah. I was really nervous about that because I'm like, man, am I, am I doing this wrong? You know, I'm doing this job that all these idiots I work with are just, you know, goofs. They didn't, they didn't go to Villanova. So this was the beginning of the start of my arrogance. I'll explain <laughs> that. Because now I'm making all this money. Yeah, you've got... I'm, I, I, I didn't used to be this chubby. I was a killer volleyball player. I was a, you know all-conference volleyball player. And um, and I thought I was awesome. You know, I started to begin to think I was awesome. My five-year plan, forget that. hundred grand, that's for nothing. You know, that's for babies. Yeah. I want to make 500 grand. Yeah. And... So that was when I got my Civic SI and started mod- I had a $50,000, $12,000 Civic because I had put all every part and piece in it I ever wanted. <laughs> you know, I had Volk wheels and CompTech exhaust. And You should find some old pictures of that. I'm curious to see I, that. I have it. It was legit. I had, you know, I had Volk Civic 16s. Civic fanboy and, right dude, here. I loved, dude, I loved the EM1. <laughs> so, it's like yeah, the, EM1 Electron Blue 99 SI. Nice. You know, yep. you know yeah, I like had the best. Um, yep. I was dreaming about doing a B18 swap. Uh, I had Type R seats in it. Oh, I mean, really? I yeah. was legit. When everybody was Ricer, I was JDM yo. You know, yeah. I was. <laughs> yeah. I was. Did you I, have the? Do you have the stock wing on the back or no wingless? No, mine was wingless. Okay. Um, cool. I had a carbon fiber hood. You know, I had a Comtech header, a Toda header, Comtech exhaust, test pipe. Um, ITR shift linkage. I mean, that car was freaking awesome. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You know, and then I did an IASCA Pro um, competition sound cue system in it. I had an old Alpine F1 head unit and kicks, you know, custom kick panel, um, Illusion audio subs, and or eight inch, eight inch mid range and active, full active power was tuned. The freaking car was so awesome. So it was a beast. Insane. It was the yeah. beginning of the yeah. obsession yeah. with cars, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, I grew up a car guy. My dad had a 66 GTO, and that's mm-hmm. kind of how, how I got into it. So when I graduate, all my buddies are going to work for these companies. I'm like, I want to I see where this goes. Although I was nervous about that because I, I might lose out on my opportunity to be an engineer. Right, right. Uh, but I wasn't smart enough. Like what I wanted to do was design Sony ES processor. Well, now Sony ES was junk. I was more interested in Denon and Krell and 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 you know Anki Integra and things like that more you know higher end stuff, yeah. but I wasn't smart enough to go to Japan and d- work for Harman designing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I was smart enough, but I didn't work hard yeah. enough right. to be educated. And so I'm just figuring I'm going to sell the stuff. So I wanted to move to San Diego, um, but Orlando was my second choice. I don't know why it just seemed like a cool place to go. Uh, and so when I graduated, believe it or not, I got kicked out of the house I was renting because I was too clean. <laughs> What? I used to give everybody a freaking hard time because yeah. they didn't clean their dishes and crap. Yeah. And so the kid whose brother owned the house said, look, you got to go. You know? <laughs> just and a bad influence. So that Dude, we was just want to leave dishes in the sink. <laughs> that, so so the, the odd thing is I analyzed myself here. You know, I was always this person that I always had the plans, right? I always planned to, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this. I'm going to be that. I'm going to meet this girl. I'm going to do... I always, I always planned it out, but the plan never happened. Never once did the plan ever happen right. for me. Uh, and so now here's a crossroads where I, I'm distraught, I'm kicked out of my house. Um, I said I was going to move to Orlando, so I said I'm just going to freaking do it. 
so the opportunity presented itself. I flew down. Uh, Sound Advice was much bigger, had a much bigger presence in Florida than than Bryn Marcerio did, and even in Philly. And so I flew down and said, "Look, I'm number one in in Orlando, in, in Philly. Um, I'd like to I'd like to come down here." Of course, they hired me on the spot. Uh, and so I packed my big screen TVs and my my EM1 Civic and uh, the important and, stuff. And I roll and roll to Orlando. And so I was doing doing well there. And uh, eventually, what happened was, uh, I, I think I've told this story on my podcast before, but I was accused of stealing back in Philadelphia. This has become a theme of my life, where I was accused of. Um, the, so I'm in I'm in Orlando for like eight months. I've, I've actually become number two in Orlando. So I was I'd, I'd grown really quickly and um, partner with this crazy guy who had a huge client base, and so yeah. I was able to sort of help him organize. And um, and they sat me down in a room and put the light on me and, you know, the head of shrink, and they're just basically saying, you know, handed this 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 receipt over to me. Well, what's this all about? It, it was basically it was like I had a policy with all my buddies at Villanova, anybody that was a friend of mine that I'd do 20 up. That was a friends and family discount, 20% above cost. And so I, I did 20 up for them and I'd vaguely, cause I'd sold millions of dollars of stuff mm -hmm. and I'd developed lots of friends cause I've held, I, yeah. I was playing with cool stuff. So even though I was an introvert, I, I became known as the guy you'd go to if you wanted to do your car stereo. And so I, I like, I remembered the, inst vaguely remembered the installers coming and saying, look, we need more money for labor for this ticket. You didn't put enough labor on it cause the car was harder than they thought. And so I backed it out and did it at 10 up. And then what happened was the car came back for some service. I, I was gone for eight months. Yeah. And then there was a new manager at the store. They didn't know the guy. And so they're looking at the ticket, and there's some things in the car that weren't on the ticket. And so they thought I gave the guy stuff or something crazy, which I, I never do. I don't give anybody anything. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was like a game-time decision whether they sent me to jail like for theft yeah. or I got to keep my job. And so they sent me home. Now this had attacked my character. Yeah, like, right. I had a key to the store. I managed the money for the gosh darn. Like I, I would come in and, and balance the books at the end of the night because nobody could do it as well as I could. And and I mean I like lived and loved this place, and now they're accusing me of stealing. Yeah. And so it was that moment that I'm like I, I this, there, there was a, a, a kind of like when I got kicked out of the house. It was another crossroads again. I always had these elaborate plans, but the plans never happened. But I was always open to whatever opportunity presented itself. So the opportunity to move to Orlando happened, I did it. I executed it, made it happen. And and so maybe it was maybe a month or so afterwards, I was trying to figure out how the heck I'm going to get out of there. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I'm making $110,000. I have a, you know, I have that, now I had a, a new Formula Red APT, AP1 S2000. You know, with bronze Volks on, it was all legit, and you know, and I had, you know, Mu all Mugen parts and everything. The thing was awesome, um, so I had to pay for that. Because mm -hmm. one thing I didn't do early on, I was never very fiscally responsible. Yeah, I knew I'd make more money, so I just bought whatever I wanted. Yeah. In fact, uh, it was kind of known. People thought my buddy and I were drug dealers because <laughs> we always had cool stuff. He was just independently wealthy through his yeah. family and i was balling hard because i'm you know 20 years old making 110 grand well it's right? just after the fast and furious franchise as well so people oh, are probably yeah. like oh he's running parts for harry dude. yeah he's he's, hardcore, you know, yeah. Yeah, he's he's doing yeah. something to he's get this money K civics like, yeah. uh, i went to turbos. i went to fast and furious one five times because it was an event yeah yeah we went yeah. to the theater it was yeah. an event everybody it was always a car out. show out front yeah. when yeah. it was in like because everybody would drive their cars although it was kind of fake it was was, that was our culture. Oh, that right? was the, yeah, yeah. that built, was the scene. Built right? it up, and so here I am being accused of this, and and I'm looking for a way out. And a guy walks in my store, and um, what generally happened is again, all the goose would be huddled around waiting for the next up, and they would say, "Can I help you?" Which is like cardinal sin number one in retail. You never say, "Can I help you?" Because what do you say? I'm just looking. Yeah. yeah, I never said that. Mainly because I was too busy. So I was out staging cables and stuff for a big job I'd sold because I was doing a lot of custom install stuff, you know, high end, you know, um, in custom install home theaters. Yeah, and in the wealthy area in, in Orlando, the West Orlando, 
And so I just walked up to the guy, set the cables down. I walked up, and he was looking at a Pioneer Elite plasma. I remember they were like eight grand at the time for a 50 inch plasma. And, uh, and so I walked up and I just started talking to him about the you know, virtues of it and I asked him about what he's going to do and what's his room like. And by the end of it, he'd, um, he said, man, you'd be great at doing what I do. And I was, it's kind of like blowing him off, but it, it, in the back of my mind, I wanted out yeah. because mm-hmm. they attacked my character and these people are, you know, I, I hated them. And I'm you know, remember this is the development of the arrogant Matt because yeah. now I'm yeah. you know I'm well off and I'm the man I'm still in good shape so fat people are you know <laughs> yeah. suck and I didn't know I'd become one of yeah. one and um, and so I you know I I I just heard him out and I wasn't really entertaining but he kept pushing his name was Jim man you should really come and hear what I have to do he gave me his card and then he came back and ended up buying the stuff. And we had uh, interest refinancing at the time. It was called. It was like a twenty-four month same as cash or something like that. Yeah. And so I asked him, said, hey, "Would you like to, to like to get that uh, in order to buy the stuff?" He's like, "Yeah, sure. Um, we'll, we'll we'll do that. That way, I can you know, I don't want to give you my money. I can you know, just pay it off over time." And in the credit application, you had to fill out your name and address and all that stuff. And in the bottom right-hand corner, there was a column or a little box, and there was a circle box next to it for monthly or annually. And you had to write in your income because you're, you're applying for credit. Yeah. And I had to go punch into the thing, and it would give you an instant approval, or sometimes you need to call. And it's and, and I had to ask him because he didn't circle it. I said, um, is that per month or per year? He said, no, 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 that's per month. I think it was like 48000 or something like that. And I'm like, holy crap. I'm yeah. making 110 Gs. Um, yeah. This guy's making six hundred. I'm like, I took his card and then I started the pursuit. And I'm like, man, this, he believes in me. Yeah, I want to make six hundred grand. And so he worked for Merrill Lynch, and so I started the process. So I was 23 at the time. I started the process of interviewing. And now Merrill Lynch doesn't hire 23 year old guys. You know, at least not to be financial advisors. Yeah. They hire 33-year-old guys or 50-year-old guys to be financial the people with life experience. Because imagine you have to teach, you have to convince people to manage their life savings. Right. And so, I ended up having 13 interviews over the course of a year and a half. Um, and every single time, they said, "Man, this guy's got something," but he looks like Opie Taylor. Yeah. Now I didn't freaking know who Opie Taylor was. I didn't know <laughs> Andy whatever. I still don't even remember. What's it? Andy, Andy Griffith. Griffith. Andy Griffith. I yeah. never watched black and white crap. I was watching The Matrix. <laughs> yeah. You know, Blade. You know. Yeah. Gladiator. <laughs> yeah. You know. I'm watching. You know. You know. I want. I want big cinema. I don't yeah. freaking Andy Griffith. That's for goofs. Yeah. And so I went and looked it up. Finally, after like the twelfth interview, I said, I have to figure out who this Opie Taylor. Could, I don't even know what that is. And then I come to find out, well, Opie Taylor's Ron Howard. Ron Howard's a pretty successful dude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I think what finally got me the job, I said, look, you guys keep calling me Opie Taylor. You keep stringing me along. Um, I, I'm going to, if if you let me do this, I'm going to do this. And I'll, yeah. you know, I'm, now I'm really starting to develop the arrogant man, right? right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so there was a humbling in that I finally got the job. And the very first day I started, I got a call from HR and they're saying, look, you're on the forty thousand dollar year salary, uh, but we, you can't make that. It has to be thirty nine 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 nine, just to kick me square in the nuts, because something about how the yeah. program, the training program, was set up, and so I went out and I started the same process I did with with um, selling stereos. I wanted to become the foremost expert, yeah. right, and pursue because I didn't know how to sell unless I knew everything. Yeah. Um, now, again, there's an arrogance to me, but you wouldn't you wouldn't know it. Like I was a really nice guy. I was a you know, I was a bashful guy, um, but but I was starting to develop this internal arrogance that I didn't know about until later on yeah. in the story here. But I when I started, um, my the gym was my mentor. I'd gone to choose to go to a retirement community because I knew who I would call there, and I just did whatever he said to do. So it's kind of like what I did with 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 um, with car stereo and things. I, I would find someone that I thought was better than me, that I could glean right. off yeah, of yeah, the yeah. information off of. But I would take it a level further than what they had suggested, or maybe ten steps further than what they suggested. And so I started my certified financial planner designation. By the time I was done, I think I had thirty four letters behind my name. I had you know ten. I held ten different industry designations. So weird because I'm not a studious guy, but yeah. I 
I'm a knowledge guy yeah. pursuing the knowledge. Yep. And so the job was, which I thought was managing stocks and bonds. I mean, this is cool. It's Wall Street. This is awesome. No, the job was cold calling. <laughs> the job was sitting in a room by yourself because nobody else is cold calling. I'm the only newbie there. Everybody yeah. else has been doing this for 15 years. They don't have to. Yeah. Right. But I have to. And it was horrible. Like the horror, because in stereos, one, I love the stuff. I was passionate about the stuff, but I would, um, and I get to just sit there and wait People for the. People came up. to you, yeah. Yeah, and then eventually I started well, developing referral Also, you referral get to play with the business. stuff that you like. Yeah. In yeah. between, now yeah. I'm sitting in this crappy office, like, and, and it was real. We had the lowest rent Merrill Lynch office in the entire country. Some Merrill Lynch offices are insane, you know, beautiful, <laughs> but this one was older. We were slated to get a new office. Um, and but but the the argument to all these guys is if you can bring in clients here, you can bring them in anywhere. And so I sat there. So my goal, through, you have you have four months to get your Series Seven, your Series Sixty Six. My goal was I'm going to have three quarters of my CFP done. It normally takes guys ten years to get it. I'm going to have it done before I even get my license. Yeah. And so I just hit it hard. So I had my CFP done in eight months, um, and I had. I, I went and chased all these other designations that and everybody told me you're wasting your time. I said, no, I need to know this stuff in order to be able to sell, yeah. be able to, to, to do it. And so my goal was to make 400 cold call dials a day. And uh, I averaged probably closer to about 180. I kept statistics because I was just afraid. I was yeah. afraid of the phone. Uh, some days, some weeks, I wouldn't call. I would sit there and I'd study or I'd get stuck into the vortex of the computer and try to learn something new and pretend like I was working. And that's why most people fail as financial professionals because they don't give you clients. They give you a desk and a phone and say, figure yeah. it out. Yeah. And, and you know, we didn't have, you know, you couldn't internet market. And it really didn't exist in yeah. 2005 anyway. But you couldn't just get on Facebook and develop a following. You couldn't no. make, you couldn't do any of that stuff. It's, uh, you're, you weren't allowed. One, it wasn't a thing then. Yeah. Secondly, it's, it, you're just not allowed to. Yeah. And so I just emulated what Jim did. And then I made it through the training program, you had to gather a certain amount of assets and a certain amount of production in, a certain, in, in 24 months. And so I graduated by the skin of my teeth. And then eventually I ended up um, you know, being somewhat successful. Um, and, uh, and, and I became the resident director. And then I became a vice president and the senior vice president. And, uh, and in 2014, we'd, mo we'd moved offices several years prior to that. In 2014, I'm the most senior guy. I'm, I'm responsible for hiring and firing everybody for the market. Plus, I had a substantial practice that uh, Jim had retired, so I'd taken over part of his book. I had a partner. We had six people on my team. I was responsible for 14, a staff of 14 of wow. you know highly yeah. compensated professionals. I'm the youngest guy. I'd go down to the manager conferences and meetings, and I'm 31 years old. Everybody else is 50 and 60. Yeah. Uh, and so I developed a massive arrogance. I mean, I thought I was the man. I'm making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Right. You know, building significant wealth for myself, uh, and and you know, I was into cars, and you know, and then I got my first BMW, and I got my first Porsche, and just sort of taking that car guy pro you know, progression. And in 2014, we had our second child, and um, I um, I wigged out, like I just I didn't know what was wrong with me. You know, I'm an engineer, I just freezing out. Yeah. Um, I've always suffered from this. I just didn't know it, but I, I was eventually diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and I'd closed everybody out because I thought I was the man. Yeah. And I'm making all this money. I, I took the weight. I, even though I had a team of people, I wouldn't let anyone do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd do it everything. And, and I, you know, felt responsible for everything and everybody. And I, I obsess about my, the next 40 years of my life, your life, and everybody else's life around me. And I, we had Kate, and I just was standing in a store, and just this wave of anxiousness came out of nowhere, and I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't reason out of it. It turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months. I couldn't get off the couch. I'd go to the office. My wife would have to come get me. I couldn't drive. And eventually, I had to go meet with a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist referred me to a psychologist. They put me on some happy pills. And um, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, and uh and i had to like i had to be like i had to lean on people for yeah, the first yeah, time yeah so this yeah. whole story of arrogance 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 was building 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 and then bang humble yeah like 
instantaneous yeah. humbling of I'm better than you. I'm stronger than you. I'm faster than you. I'm I'm have more money than you. I'm yeah. smarter than you. All this stuff that I told myself. Again, now don't get me wrong. I wasn't a Type A jerk. Yeah. I was a Type C. It was all in me, all internal, and and so I wouldn't let anybody else have the win. I did everything. You know, my assistant, I would do everything. And so I, I at this moment, and this is August August fourteenth, two thousand fourteen. I'm not better than anybody. I'm worse. Yeah. Like this mindset change just happened like that. And and so through lots of therapy, through months of therapy and meeting with this goofball therapist that I would have dismissed before, yeah. I was completely open to suggestion, to other people helping me, to letting others in. Yeah. And so I started the YouTube channel. Actually, what I did start doing was I started sharing the ownership experience of my cars on Renlist and Bimmer Post. And the YouTube channel came about to support that because through therapy, I decided to give up my hangups about people, you know, berating me or, or calling me out or, or me, me not being the smartest or the best because, you know, on forums, I mean, you guys have all been oh, part yeah, of them. It's get... a, it's a cesspool <laughs> of hate. Yeah. Yeah. But I said, you know what? I don't care about that. I never did care about what other people thought. And now I really didn't care. Not only did I not care, but I was humble that I would listen to what you said, mm -hmm. and I and I wouldn't snap back. Uh, and so I started writing, you know, and I started journaling, and I started connecting. And then, because of my all this knowledge that I built, and all of this, despite the arrogance, I really did know something. I really did have something in my head yeah. that could benefit the world. And because I was now approaching it from a humble perspective, not an arrogant perspective, it opened me up to people being a part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the journals turned into the YouTube channel, and I was operating as Matt Mormon on YouTube, and um, and you know, I'm still still at Merrill Lynch, still doing my thing. And but that was a, there was there was the Matt in the two thousand dollar suit, and then there was the Matt, which eventually became the Obsessed Garage Matt. Yeah. And, and and let me rephrase. There is no obsessed garage match. It's just me. You know, I'm just doing me. Right, but the you yeah. uh, the the fancy you, and then the you and your normal right. daily, like your so, t-shirt and shorts. Right, like. right. And so there's the trailer park me, the humble me, and then there was the Merrill Lynch me. And it took me a while to 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 Find balance. Well, to disconnect in my mind that there were two me's like yeah. i even had a style consultant that like i thought when i was around town i needed to wear something different oh wow yeah right i didn't want people to see me so even though i'm humble that i'm doing me and that was just an outlet there was no agenda i wasn't trying to build a right. business i wasn't trying to sell anything um i wasn't trying to show off even though that's what the the take was yeah i think a lot of people took it as that but the the fruit of it was the people that got it got it and they changed my life they would reach out to me hey you know how do i get a eventually got a blue gt3 how do i get a gt3 i have a civic or i have a m3 i want to do that and so then i eventually got on the i would get on the phone with kids or 50 year old guys that wanted to figure out what i was all about they were, they were intrigued and so i'd be talking to people all the time and that's when i made the this is me series on youtube yeah. and told my story mainly just to get people off my back because i couldn't I couldn't keep telling my two-hour story over and over again. Yeah. The story I'm telling you right now. I was gonna say we're making yeah. you do it right now. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, so how, like, so that was the. Would you say that's the hardest part of your entire life? Was was that was those? Oh yeah. Those yeah. months, years, you know, like what, you know, like, were you just was it a constant internal struggle? To it was where, a constant infinite anxiety attack. Yeah. All day, all night, uh, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. Yeah. Um, and and then eventually they put me on Prozac and it. It's kind of balanced me out over time. I'm not on it anymore, uh, but I'm still like right now. I'm in a constant struggle of am I panicked? Yeah, twenty four seven every day. And I, I just don't think people people don't see that in your videos, right? So people see you and and people that maybe have never struggled with anxiety or depression or anything like that don't really know that it's something that is is beyond. You, it, it's it's you know it's not don't you, it's, out it's of like it? it's like seeing like. a meme where I've seen it before yeah. where you know somebody's being anxious and your friend says hey don't worry about it don't be anxious right. and you're like yeah. oh thank don't you be that. you, you healed work that me way, right. it, yeah. and you. I was the poster child of saying that's freaking weak bro just tough off just be tough yeah 
and and so that yeah that was and I, I still it's it's an up and down yeah. you know battle I, I don't know why it didn't present itself it just came like that yeah like i was always obsessed and i was always you know very particular um i again i wouldn't call myself a perfectionist i'm just always pursuing excellent 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 in anything that i cared about if i didn't care about it, i was terrible so it's all or nothing it's yeah. kind of my tagline yeah. Yeah. right yeah and so the you know this this transition to humble uh was was life changing for me and now at an audience of people and so i made a this is me series and i started sharing my life a little bit and then i started to get you know well, i'm at merrill lynch and i started to get people searching that out so yeah. here i am i'm trying to build the business i'm trying to grow it always always attempting to make it bigger make it better um and but again there was suit mat and this mat yeah. you know the one you see sitting here and and so i started to make this connection to man if i'm this obsessed about the spray bottle that i'm using or the microfiber towel that i'm interested in and or the the spec sheet of the carrera s that i ordered and i spent that much time and energy on it people started to make that natural connection that man what does he do for a living right. first of all how does he have this stuff and then i started to tell the story of that of this that i'm telling you and then they made a direct correlation with well man i want this guy to manage my money mm -hmm. right uh, so in my business started to benefit from this social connectivity this accidental humbling yeah. this accidental social connectivity <sighs> and you guys seen it I i'm making 50 minute videos sometimes it's boring i'm sure that yeah every one of you has checked off of it this is too much but i'm just doing it the only way that i knew how to do right. it yeah yeah and and i wasn't at in the beginning i didn't edit squad i just real time ran the camera yeah. and i didn't even chop it up i didn't have an intro didn't have an outro didn't have music didn't have drone shots nothing it's just me raw sometimes you're gonna even hear me i'm out of focus you know and uh but people were really connecting with it you know in the in the hundreds and then in the thousands then in the tens of thousands and so eventually i came to the conclusion that you know i i couldn't do it at you know at merrill anymore that um i wanted to really intimately connect it to i wanted to create eventually i created obsessed wealth management um so i, I left merrill and went and, and and went to with another company and um with raymond james and and started to build that and eventually separated from my partners and um and and then come 2016 is when i made t-shirts and yep. hats uh, I just and and my whole thesis there was, man, I, I kind of want to have one for the videos. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I renamed the channel Obsessed Garage. I built Obsessed Garage website on WordPress, which we talked about earlier, and I um, I mainly just to get people off my back of sending. The reason why I made the This Is Me videos is so I could just say, hey, here, refer to it. Here's right. my yeah. story. I made obsessedgarage.com so I could say here, here are the products that I use. Here's where you can buy them. Yep. Here's where you, here's an Amazon link. Here's a detailer's domain link. Here's a rag company link. Here's a microfiber tech link. Here's where you, yep. here's a Grios garage link. Uh, and and then I've come to the realization, well, maybe I should send you Amazon links because I can get paid a little bit for that. Um, and then my you know YouTube channel was monetized, and and that's when Merrill Lynch started looking at the videos and saying, look, you can't say this, you can't say that. Um, which I don't fault them. I mean, that's true. You have to be very cognizant of how you how you're advertising and representing. Um, but I, I again, I, I knew that there was this connection. At one point, um, Taylor Swift's dad works for Merrill Lynch. Um, oh, really? He was the number one search, and we were number two. <laughs> uh, um, and so I got a call from Merrill Lynch Marketing saying, "What the heck are you doing?" I said, "Well, I have this YouTube channel, and I'm just sharing, you know, my life and you know, and what I'm doing with cars." And, uh, and that's when I came to the epiphany, man, I could really connect this. Uh, then, you know, sold the t-shirts. I launched the t-shirts in the Facebook group, the Obsessed yep. Garage Facebook group. And uh, the first month, I think I sold $12,000 worth of t shirt $10,000 worth of t-shirts. Yeah. Like that. Which is crazy. Healthy. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Now, I pursued it. It took me nine months to create the t-shirt right. because yeah. I wanted it right. I wanted it specific. Yeah. Uh, and I had a fire and hire and fire companies and doing my normal right. session. But I did it very differently. I didn't do it arrogantly. I, I kind of, at least I think I did it differently. 
uh, and and the Facebook group was the a way for me to give people a voice. Um, and because forum, I wanted a forum because of my, I you know the nostalgia of what forums have done for me. But forums yeah. are tricky. Forums are they're dying. Yeah. yeah, they're dying off. And and yeah, I was just gonna have to spend tons of money to make it work. Uh, and that just didn't make sense. And so the shirts um, made me build a Shopify store, yeah. right? So I had to build a, a store. And so I had obsessgarage.com and then obsessgaragestore.com. Uh, and then um, I would developed, uh, eventually I was making a few hundred bucks on Google AdSense, you know, through making yep. videos. Uh, so this would be 2016, mid to late 2016. And then I went to SEMA and I met a bunch of people. You guys weren't there yet. I hadn't met you guys yet. Um, but uh, I went to SEMA, and I'm like, man, I think I could, I think I could build a business out of this. Yeah. Uh, and and then uh, Amazon shut my account down. I tried to set up Amazon Pay for the T-shirts, and it caused some sort of fraud attempt, and they shut the account mm. down. I couldn't get reopened. I was making like eighteen hundred bucks a month, two thousand bucks a month on Amazon click-throughs yeah. through yeah. ObsessedGarage.com, and then all the links that are built in all the videos, and then those links get shared, and it kind yeah, of spreads out yeah. through cyberspace, and then people start to use the links, and you start to make some money. Yeah. And now I'm making none, and then I was like, shoot. Um, you know, we talked about you guys are selling stuff on Amazon. It's volatile. I mean, they could take it away at any moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's a scary proposition. So I decided, look, I'm building my house on somebody else's land. I need to build, I'm going to build my own store. And so I got on the phone. The first thing I was going to launch was my Krenzel pressure washer. Yep. First nice. off, I called them up and said, hey, uh, hey, Krenzel, how you doing? Uh, this is Matt Mormon. They said, ho, 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 hold on. First of all, it's not Krenzel, it's Krenzel. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, oh, shoot. Well, all this time I've been making videos about this and <laughs> I've been like your biggest fan and I don't even know how to say the name. Yeah. Now I knew I'm really on to something. I'm like, shoot, they've done such a poor job marketing this yeah. in the U.S. that nobody even knows how to pronounce it. You know, and so not everybody's marketed like the, the cup here, like Rup Rupes has done a fan masterful yeah. job. You guys have done a great <laughs> job marketing the product. A lot of these obscure companies haven't. Right. Uh, and and it's largely due to the fact that they're so focused on building a great product that they just have it becomes an afterthought yeah. I think, and so I said, well, I'd like to secure five pressure washers, um, and could I do that? Um, and then I called the uh, Mosmatic, and uh, and then I called MTM. Krenzel said no, Mosmatic said no, uh, MTM said maybe. Called Krenzel, no. Called Mosmatic, no. I wanted to become a dealer. Uh, and I called MTM. They said, okay, yeah, we'll let you do it. So I called Krenzel. I said, hey, MTM's going to let me do it. They said, maybe. I called Mosmatic. Hey, hey, um, Krenzel said, maybe. Uh, MTM said, said yes. Or uh, They said, okay, if MTM said yes, then yeah, we'll say yes. And then th this is over the course of several months. So I procured the inlet hose, the quick disconnects, built the package that I'd been using yep. that I'd been beat my head against the wall to figure out how to make work for years. And um, and then I made 13 videos of each part and piece. I think I had 72,000 subscribers. This was January of 2017, last year. And I lost, uh, I was like 46, 4,700 subscribers overnight. Because I'd launched 13 <laughs> videos within an hour. Because people are freaking About out. Pressure he's washer just going to obsess over like a nut <laughs> yeah. on the thing. It'd be like, oh, he's hour. jumped the shark. He's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now he's just pitching. He's, he's lost it, yeah. <laughs> right. And I had a lot of Adam LZ subscribers too, and they're like, yeah. they just want to watch my GT3. Yeah, sure. And so I lo I'm like, oh, I, I screwed up. No one's going to buy this. But I had the next morning, I wake up, I had you know dozens of emails saying, hey, I want to be first on the list. Yeah. Because I'd launched it as a pre order. Right? Yeah. And this is the start of now I see pre orders all over the place. I yeah. like to think I have a, a you know a part in this. The only reason I had a pre order because they didn't have any of the stuff. Mosmetic didn't have a single gun. In fact, they called me and tried to talk me out of it. Oh, wow. I think I'm 2,200 of these guns sold, plus the probably 2,000 others that have been sold by other copycats yeah. out there um, that have stolen my, my ideas, uh, which, you know, that's just competition. Um, but that very first month in January, I did $45,000 of sales between my shirts, stickers, and then pressure washer pre-orders. And then yeah. February, I did 50000 and March I did sixty thousand, and then you know July I did a hundred thousand, yeah. And then now I'm like, holy crap, this is insane, yeah. right? 
and then by you know by the end of the year I'm doing 150,000. What is your wife thinking of all this <laughs> at this point? Where is she at? Well, for the longest time I'd been building Obsessed Garage yeah. and I'm like I think I'm on to something. It was all, you know, wealth management. I think people will start to connect that and it's benefiting my business. I really hadn't gotten much out of it cuz yeah. people were making the connection and searching out but they couldn't figure out like is he jerking on the cars all day? How yeah. could you possibly make this many videos? How could you, you know, do all of this? Right. Well, I'm obsessed. I'm, I'm literally, in, I can't stop. Yeah. Uh, and so I can do it all. And plus, I'd spend 30,000 hours becoming, I, I don't like to term myself as an expert. I like to let other people call me an expert. But I like to think I was an expert in wealth management. And so I didn't need to spend as much time on that as I did before because I knew. You're at the top of your game now on that spot. Yeah. So right. you didn't have to practice as much. Top of my game. So I was the Krenzla of wealth management. Yeah. I don't know how to tell anybody what I did. So I was making a lot of money for in, in the average American terms, but not I wasn't a top financial advisor by any means. Not even yeah. close. Because I didn't know how to tell anybody who I was. Again, there was suit mat and, and, and this mat, you know, the, the uh, T-shirt mat. Yeah. Well, and this has happened recently, uh, I started to figure out that, you know, just do you and people will connect. And so I called it obsessed wealth management, and uh, and I started to get some some traction. Now I've come to re realize that the the regulatory environment is a little difficult to be a public figure like I am, um, or I've become in my little niche. Uh, and so obsessed garage is my passion. I'm really focused on that. Um, but the you know the building of the store, like I'm here, like seeing how you guys ship and pack and receive, you know millions of towels and how that's fascinating to me and so i've realized how to take not arrogance not you know i'm better than but how to take this insatiable unquenchable disorder yeah you know this appetite for i don't give a crap about success i don't give a crap about money i thought i did it's not the money it's the pursuit of being able to have a conversation like this with people sharing my story sharing a product yeah. sharing the knowledge that i've learned over the years and then that's turned into a way for me to sell crap yeah. crap that i really like yeah. <laughs> to me yeah. it's not crap to me it's awesome you know it's yeah, amazing it's fun stuff stuff. Yeah. stuff that you like it's your hot wheel right. cars right. or well, your matchbox you cars like you have more purpose than ever yeah. right oh I mean, yeah yeah, yeah. So now the pursuit is the chase of building out a destination, a place that I it doesn't exist, that I think only I can, again, not arrogantly, but humbly, I think I'm suited to build this thing that nobody else has done. And, and, and I know some people look at it from the outside, which is just building a retailer. And in fact, many of my friends or what were friends that are retailers aren't you know, too happy with me. Yeah. Uh, but I, I can't, I have to ignore that. I have to chase what this is, which I believe is a consultative, you know, destination. It's a destination for people that want to learn about something and have a shared passion for it. Or maybe they don't have a passion for it. They just want somebody to tell them what to do. Yeah, basically. And that, that's how I see it is there's this whole, we, and we've talked about this on the podcast, like just in our industry and in detailing in general, for years, I never had any, you know, I had to just go about it with what the guy on the truck that was coming by my shop showed me. Yep. You know, you couldn't get online and search for stuff. You could find some stuff, but most companies weren't selling online. So you had to find that. But now you have an almost an overflow of information for, yeah. for folks in detail. And, and we get that all the time. People call us and just go, what what are your five best towels that will work for me? What is the, the you know, what is the, you know, there's too much stuff. And you've really, I don't know, figured that out in the sense that customers follow you because you've created a solution. Like you've created, look, guys, I've tested everything. This is what works for me. The fascination for me that. is that, that despite my, my former arrogance, I didn't think anybody cared what I had to say. Yeah. You know, only I cared what I had to say. Uh, and, and, and I think people really do. They, 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 they can see through the stuff. You know, the people that, that, that I want to understand what I'm saying, they see through this. It's not about the stuff. Um, you know, it's about my, my story and how my story applies to them. And then the stuff, 
it happens to be something that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a car, maybe it was a towel, maybe it was a polish, maybe it was something. And then the credibility that I hopefully have and continue to maintain is what creates the destination. What, what, it's the reason why people are bringing me into their living room and allowing me to be a part of their life. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating to me and it's, it's extremely motivating, crippling to me at times because I and remember I, I am obsessed. Like this brand is not fake. Yeah. And I think you guys know me. There's no extra. No, Unfortunately, yeah. there's no, <laughs> there's no extra entertainment value. There's no extra stuff. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. You know, this is all I got. Yeah. And, and the, the, I think obsessed garage needs to exist. Yeah. yeah. You know, for one, for me, for my sanity, um, but, but for the world, I think, and, and I think I can change, like, I think I can change whatever little part of the world I'm changing, uh, whether it's disruptive. And that, that's the frustrating thing is I just want to be accepted. I don't want to fight, but I'm creating, I've created lots of disruption in wealth management. I've created lots of disruption in detailing in garage stuff and and I I I'm doing my best to turn a blind eye to it and just focus on what I know. Yeah. Uh, and that's been tricky and it, it's been really helpful guys like you guys have been so supportive. You know, instead of being competitive, yeah. it's yeah. hey, whatever we can do, you know, let's let's support each other. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's what's continued to motivate me and elevate you know, everybody. Me. That's our that's yeah. our whole yeah. thing, yeah. you know. High tide floats all boats. Well, that's why we don't, you know, like our IK sprayers or some of these other products we carry, we don't slap our name on it and pretend it's ours. We try and insist that these brands that we believe in are able to be elevated as well alongside uh, whatever credibility we can bestow on that. Yeah, because, yeah. I, mean, like, I mean, the people that we work with are people that we believe in, you know. Uh, you know, we believe in you. We believe in uh, Jace Price. We believe in all these people that we w that we work with and um, and distribute with and, and, and talk to every day. And, and we're we we look forward to each other's success. I mean, constantly. So I think the overwhelming message of all of this, and as I analyze myself, I analyze you guys. Is, you know, is is humble authenticity. You know, being being somewhat humble, knowing when knowing when you're good and knowing when you're not you yeah. know, having some some self-awareness around that uh but being authentic with it yeah you know showing up here in you know like i, I was thinking about it i have an omega c master right which was the fake me it's a twelve thousand dollar watch <laughs> and i'm like I, you know it, it's like i i would find myself in the past wearing that watch to like try to present this persona yeah you know, make this person that I'm not. Mm. Uh, and so I've been thinking about, you know, I wish I could sell it for 12,000. It's worth like <laughs> four grand or something. I might as well just keep it for that. Yeah. Um, but, but the, um, the, the authenticity part, you know, in, in the past, I would have felt like I needed to put that watch on to show you that I'm a success or to yeah. show you that I'm some version of me. And, through the realization of this whole thing, people really started to hire me in wealth management because I'd shown them, like I stopped wearing suits and I was just wearing a polo, yeah, you know, and I, I'm wearing my t-shirt around and my hat around all over the place because that's what I'm comfortable in. And then letting people know, look, I'm not, I'm not in the office every day, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need to be. So instead of faking it, just telling people what it is and being okay with who I was and who yeah. I am, well, and I noticed, it's been life changing. Well, I noticed that when I ran my shop, it's just being open and honest with your customers and the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd have customers that would call and go, "Hey, can you squeeze me in right now?" I, I can't because the work's not going to be there. It's not going to yeah. look right. And they go, "Okay, that's fine. Thank you for." And then they'd schedule it. You right. know, and it was it's getting past that honesty. And being able to be open and honest that makes yeah. those people bond with you. And I think you do a really good job of it, which is why you have so many followers. <laughs> well, I'm still your trying channels to figure it out. I mean, every you, time I tell you this. You are raw. Like you are, this is me. This is my life. Every time you I know? tell this, I'm not telling this to be honest with you. I'm not telling this for you. I'm telling this to try to figure myself out. Yeah. yeah. You know what's crazy is, you know, like a Myers-Briggs test, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're yeah, ES, yeah. Or yeah. ESTJ mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. I, I was always an INTJ and I knew exactly who I was and I love the fact that I was like 2% of people are INTJ. Yeah. Well, I've retaken it six times and I'm not INTJ. Wow. And it's like blew my freaking mind. I'm like, I have no idea who I am. Yeah. yeah. I was 
E N T J. And I'm like, E no, not E. It was still I no, it was I I S T J or something like that. Had had less to do with, you know, a little less to do with introversion and the yeah. like selective extroversion yeah. or something. And I took the test over and over and over and over. We had it kind of going in our group there for a while and and I'm I'm like, who the heck am I? Yeah. Like what what happened? Like I knew ex- I I was prided myself on a key sense of self awareness. Well, what it was was arrogance and insecurity. The arrogance is just insecurity, and so now I'm I, you know I'm telling the story. I'm sitting here trying to figure out what the frick am what, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, I'm I'm chasing obsessed garage. I'm chasing it whole hog. It scares the freaking crap out of me. Yeah. But it's it's fun. Well, and it's yeah, well, I, yeah, it's yeah, life. He's like, he's like, I don't know if I'd say it's fun, to. but you know, it's it's yeah, it's a process. <clears throat> it's it's definitely it's a growing there's experience, that. and it changes you. But yeah. there's also it's getting out of that comfort zone. It's creating right. something else that you don't there's have a lot control of over. Right. You, you thought know. I was joking about uh, taking you to two o'clock, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 no, this is quality, man. Yeah, it, it is. Well, I'm glad you guys give me the chance to tell it. I mean, it it helped. This is what has helped me more than anything, the therapeutic aspect of telling your story, giving up because because there's a certain sense of narcissism I'm sitting here telling you a two hour version of what my story. But when I give that up and just do it, it opens me up to the world. Oh, yeah. And it's like I said, I've said this six times already. It's life changing. You know, yeah. it's it's incredible. And maybe the money the, the maybe the money comes maybe you know i continue to sell lots of crap and and make lots of money and buy lots of cars and have lots of individual success maybe that happens maybe it doesn't but th- that's you know I, I, that's not the motiv- motivation the motivation yeah. is to just do me and and enjoy it mm-hmm. and hope to have less moments of panic <laughs> yeah god dang it <laughs> moments of rest yeah yeah, yeah. that's the Very plan cool. All right, cool. Dane. Well, yeah, All this right. has been awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for thank you so much for telling your story and we and, really and appreciate you coming on. Yeah, dude. And, and, so. do, and doing this. So thanks. And uh, anyway, guys, if you're watching, you're probably on YouTube on the Red Company channel. If you're listening, you're probably on Shout Engine at the Red Company podcast. And once again, thanks so much to Matt for coming on for me, and uh, telling us this story. Check it out, obsessedgarage.com. Check out the podcast, Dialed In Podcast. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, plug your stuff. Yeah, this YouTube, is your chance. Yeah. Obsessed Garage. Yeah, Google uh, Google S, uh, Obsessed Garage, and you'll find all the stuff, you know, Instagram. You'll go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. if, you yeah. know, the, the big thing, the the, the community, you know, the facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Obsessed Garage, you get, you know, you get, fill out, make sure you fill out all the questions and you yeah, get in the do. group. We have we 21. Don't, I'm, an, I'm a moderator. We don't accept you. I just yeah. can't fill out the questions. Yeah, we have 21,000 people of that are been vetted and yeah i mean there's always going to be some goofballs that show up but it's a it's be, really become a community of people that are like-minded yeah um so if you're interested in getting involved with what i'm up to that would be the place to go and of course you know if you're if you need some some uh, light uh, sleeping uh, video material <laughs> i talk like this in all the videos where <laughs> therapeutic I, yeah 40 yeah. minutes long of me uh, talking about the virtues of a specific uh, microfiber towel yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> good stuff so once again just open your browser type in obsessed garage and yeah. you will find a wealth of information bunch of crap yeah <laughs> yeah cool all right guys thanks so much for listening we'll catch you in the next one see ya what happens when the when the force pulls you back your foot naturally comes off the gas you have to keep your foot to the floor the floor to the floor, floor.